welcome everybody to another episode of Dave Cooper Live, where we bring you the people, the products, and the process helping us to build it better. From natural disasters to national crisis like affordable housing, how are engineers solving for the world's biggest problems? Please welcome Steve Burrows, an engineer who dares to big dream big author engineer advocate and a movie star steve joins us not to provide all of the answers but to make sure we are asking the right questions however we cannot deliver all of these informative conversations without our sponsors so before we bring steve on let's give a big shout out to all of our sponsors for today's show Carson Holmquist and the team at Stream Logistics are experts in high-stake freight. They are the perfect choice for projects with timelines and a specific delivery sequence, shipments with high complexity and unique constraints. The new methods of construction need new transportation solutions, and they are up for the challenge. Visit them at streamlogistics.com. CombiLift is the largest global manufacturer of multi-directional forklifts and straddle carriers. A leader in long load handling solutions offering a free warehouse and site optimization design service. CombiLift helps companies of all sizes and from every industry maximize the capacity, safety, and efficiency of their warehouse and storage facilities. A big thank you to Paul Short and the team at CombiLift for helping us all to build it better. Visit them at combilift.com. Brave Control Solutions, where offsite manufacturing systems that do more than just improve productivity. They have a unique approach to industrialized construction, a lineup of flexible automation systems specifically designed for the construction industry and powered by CAD to Fab and turnkey solutions for 3D volumetric assembly, structural insulated panels, finished wall assemblies, MEP component processing, assembly, kitting, and storage. Learn more at thinkbrave.com. All right, again, a big shout out and thank you to all of our sponsors. And don't forget, if you're going to Advancing Prefabrication, it's March 14th through the 17th. Save yourself 10% with our discount code DCLIVE10. That's right. That'll save you a lot of money. Trust you, me. And then we can go buy a drink together while we're out there after the show's over. Either way, DC Live 10, Advancing Prefabrication. Check it out. All right, let's hop into it. Let's uh, bring on our good friend and, yes, Joel Hutchins, a movie star. Steve Burroughs. <laughs> What's happening, Steve? How are you today? I'm well, thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Joel. Yeah, I got a face made for radio. Yeah, yeah. Well, you are a TV star. <laughs> You're in IMAX movies. And, you know, uh, I would be willing to bet that 90% of all of the children across this great country uh, probably would recognize your face at some point in their lives. Thanks, Dave. Great so, to be here. Steve, why don't you, you've been on the show, you know, a while back, but why don't you take a moment and just uh, give everybody a quick overview of who Steve Burroughs is, and then we'll hop right into it. Sure. So I'm an engineer. So I've been, uh, been in the industry for over 40 years and uh, designed some pretty amazing buildings. So involved in things like the Bird's Nest Stadium for the Beijing Olympics and various other projects. But my focus now is really trying to create uh, affordable housing solutions. So that's both from materials, processes, and methods of creating those buildings, uh, but also how they get operated and maintained. So uh, affordable housing is really where I'm spending my time right now. Affordable housing. I mean, if that isn't a buzzword that we hear across the country, in the news, everywhere else, you know, housing is not affordable, Steve. So, you know, at least, I mean, I've been recently looking for a house. We were talking about this before the show. I'm like, I can't even afford what's on the mark. I can afford something, but you know, here I am. I sit here and talk about all these great things that are happening and what's going on in the world with all these great new products. And but the price of housing still through the roof. What is, what does it mean to you? Yeah, well, the price of housing is through the roof. You know, that's that's a fact. I mean, and you know, there's a, a measure called the affordability index, which measures the ratio of the average price of uh, buying a house against the average income for a household. And uh, the number is about nine times household income now to buy a house. And over history, 
certainly the history of mortgages, mortgages have been around, you know, something like 130 years. Uh, the number's been around five, five and a half times. So it's pr that's pretty unaffordable. Um, right. However, uh, I'm pretty excited about what's happening right now because you, what we're able to do is really start to look at housing affordability from the customer perspective. So let me just start there, right? If you wanted to have a home that's affordable, what would matter to you is how much money have you got left in your pocket at the end of a month? Yeah. Uh, taking into account the cost of buying the house, operating it and maintaining it. And um, that's really what matters. And I think we understand that better than ever and are able to do something about it. So that's number one question to ask is affordability is money in your pocket at the end of the month and not just what it costs you to purchase it. So money in your pocket at the end of the month and not what it costs to purchase it, you know, not just so, what it costs to purchase it. Yeah. So what, what, what is the dis, you know, the disconnect between builders and customers in this? Cause you're right. We all want to save money when we buy a house. We all want to ask the right questions. What's it going to own, you know, cost to own and operate, you know, what's my water bill going to be? What's my electric bill going to be? Um, but it doesn't seem that the, the, the big builders across the country or builders just in general for that matter, are too concerned about what our cost is to operate a home still. Now, there's a couple of big disconnects in my mind. So one is the one that you're talking about, which is, um, you know, in most other industries, the cost to build something and uh, the builder operates and maintains the thing that they create. If you think about cars, for example, uh, through the life of the product. Uh, and in homes, they don't. Once a mm -hmm. builder has, you know, finished your home, um, operating and maintaining it's your problem. And there are people who will help you with that. There might be other builders, but there isn't this sort of whole life cycle, total cost of ownership um, a connection in the construction industry. And so that's a huge opportunity for people. I think the other thing is that homes, especially in the United States, uh, are not designed for the customer. So, uh, you know, an example I like to use is, is that, you know, in your home every night you go to sleep but your bedroom wasn't this designed as the perfect sleeping place. It's predominantly exactly the same design as it was 150 years ago. Yet, we know an awful lot now about the science of sleep. Mm -hmm. And so we could create a place that is a much better place to actually sleep, but we don't. We tend to copy things that have happened in the past. The construction industry hasn't really invented uh, how people live in their homes. As your life changes, your home can't change, it's sort of fixed. And so it's, it's a very sort of passive system and it needs to be an active system. So there's a whole bunch of things. If we put the customer at the center, the customers, would a customer design the home that they presently live in, in exactly the same way? And I think the answer is no. And so we wanna put the customer at the center and create the opportunity for the customer to influence the design of a home the size of a home. I mean, in the US, homes are about yeah. three times the floor area on average that they are in the UK. And so US homes have got really bloated over the last 50 years. And so we need to design the spaces that people need that for the purposes that they use them at the cost that they can afford when you consider the whole total cost of ownership. That's the problem we're trying to solve. And we got enough wicked smart people in the construction industry to do something pretty interesting around those problems. Yeah, for sure. I'm just curious, Steve, when you say we, you know, our, our bedrooms aren't designed the way they should be. Yeah. Can, you, can you give us some ideas on how they should be designed in your, in your mind? Well, if you think about it, so, so, you know, when, when bedrooms, the bedrooms that we're in today, the sort of the way that they're organized, right. Is, and the way that they're placed was, was originally the original idea was you needed a window because you went to sleep and you woke to the sun. And then now we go to sleep and we wake, you know, to artificial light. So, you know, people, people use them at slightly different times. And, and when we put windows in bedrooms, people that when they go to sleep, people put things like blackout blinds and uh, they put, you know, twin or triple pane, plane glazing to cut down the noise. So the, the, the room is not designed, specifically designed to get the best night's sleep. Now, I'm not advocating that bedrooms, you know, you could leap to say, oh, he's suggesting bedrooms should be like these sleeping pods 
and we all sort of go to sleep in this little pod. All I'm saying is, if we think about it from the purpose, from, from the angle of the purpose is to get a good night's sleep, mm -hmm. and depending where the home is, where, the, where it's sighted, which direction it points, um, you know, uh, we, should, we would design something that's specifically around sleep. And we would design something differently, I believe. We'd have, you know, re reverberation. We have hard surfaces in the bedrooms, which cause mm -hmm. reverberation, which create noise. And so there are a multitude of things that we could do to make it better for its specific purpose. And I'm just using that one particular room. You could apply that to, you know, every place sure. in the house. We have, we have families and uh, our, our needs expand. We need more bedrooms at certain times. We need less bedrooms at other times, yet all of the walls are fixed. Most of the materials yeah. we use are not designed to be modified. You know, you could go on and on, but if you were designing a home for tomorrow instead of for yesterday, I believe it would look very different to what's being put on the market right now. And that gives an opportunity to make it sure. more affordable. So well-designed bedrooms equal more sleep, better sleep equals healthier people, right? Is that a correct assumption? I, just, I think homes are built. This is the biggest investment most people make in their yeah. lifetimes. Is and most wealth, and most people, certainly my generation, have created wealth through real estate, through owning property, and we want to create an opportunity for more people to have the opportunity to build into generational wealth through real estate. Right. And so it's not just it. It is about being happier and and having pride in the place, but it's also about functioning correctly and being affordable in a way that it provides a return on the investment. And this is a big investment cost and you wanna be able to pay for it at the peak, the, the time that you buy it, and you want it to generate wealth for you in the future. Um, yeah. And I think what people want in the future uh, are homes that you know feel like they were designed for them and not designed for you know a home builder to make a profit. And um, that's a that's a byproduct. We want home builders to make a profit, but that's that's a byproduct of a great design, not the the reason for doing it in the first place. Is is it possible to achieve? And I'm going to go back to our first topic: housing affordability. Is it possible to achieve all of these things, uh, and and still meet housing affordability across this country? Oh, I believe so. Absolutely. I think if you uh, if you just simply look at sort of designing the right size space. First of all, when you when you build a house, right, uh, let's look at cost. We talk about affordability, but let's look at the other side, look at cost. I mean, in terms of technology coming into the construction industry, um, we've got a problem that needs to be solved, which is affordability. So what are the, the five components of cost for a home are materials, labor, logistics, operation and maintenance. So there are only five components. Land is a material. Let's, mm -hmm. let's put it in the materials bucket, right? So there's only five components. Each one, that, that's not very many variables. If you were writing a piece of software and somebody said, I've only got five components that make up the, the problem, you'd think it was a really simple problem to solve. So, you know, it's not, uh, housing affordability is not a wicked hard problem when it's considered in totality. And, and so we've got to find a way. There are various people who are, you know, nibbling at little parts of the problem. So there are people looking at better materials, you know, different methods of construction, uh, reducing the labor content by going off site, um, you know, producing, re reducing the, the operational cost by having renewable power. So there, there are people who are nibbling at the edges of all the parts yeah. of the cost problem but nobody is solving it holistically at the moment. And that's the biggest opportunity. So Margaret Whelan says uh, 25 to 30% of building materials all end up in the uh, dumpster or trash due to inefficiencies. And she said that, you know, we don't have a housing affordability problem. We have a waste problem. What's your thoughts on that? I think that's a that's a component to the problem, right? So the fact of the matter is that, that when you when you buy a house, what, yeah. what are you left with? When the builder walks away, what are you left with? And the only thing you're left with, you're, you're not left with any le logistics. You're not left with any labor. You're just left with materials. So materials as an asset class, um, you, you know, are something that you cannot trade right now. So this, uh, if, if, if the waste goes to landfill, if I want to, 
you know, Ben Hur said something to me, you know, five years ago. He said, um, if you knock a hole in a piece of drywall and you want to fix it, it's cheaper to buy a, a flat screen TV and put it over the hole than it is to get somebody to come and fix the hole in the so drywall. True. And and the drywall is not a it's not a material that has no value to you after it's been installed. And so I think that, that if you wanted to modify your home and you could you could sell the materials had a value and it's and and you know stayed in the value chain, um, then you could imagine that that you would get less going to landfill because people yeah. would say, oh, I can sell these materials that I don't need anymore to my neighbor, or I can buy from my neighbor. And so there would be a circular economy around materials. And really that's what we're trying to do. You know, we're trying to find a way that we design and build in a way that the value is in the materials. Even right. if materials cost more, they retain their value over their life and allow you to modify your home as you need to, and allow you to take advantage of what you've actually paid for, which is the materials in the construction of your home. And um, it's not really done right now. And there's been a lot of people over, over you know, many years, I can remember, you know, 40, 50 years ago, this idea that, you know, if you take a bathroom pod, that's a volumetric building, mm -hmm. piece of building, and you, you make it in a factory, you bounce it down a freeway, uh, you put it into a property and then you never move it again. But you could imagine that if you could say, well, those bathrooms have to be replaced every 10 or 15 years. If you could unplug the pod and plug in a new pod and take the old pod back to the factory, reskin it and then put it in another property, there would be a circular economy around bathroom pods. And why design a vehicle, a pod to be bounced down a freeway only once right. in its life? doesn't really make sense, but we haven't created a system that allows that to happen right now. But but somebody will, because that is an obvious way to reduce waste uh, effort as an, a simple example. Yeah, for sure. So you also mentioned, you know, earlier, you know, nibbling, I think is the word used, nibbling at the edges of the five components, the compromise, the cost of, you know, the home. How do we take a bigger bite, you know, and really make a difference? Is it the supply chain? Uh, that's causing the problem, you know, does does creating a circular economy help solve that like you're talking about? I, you know, I don't think that one of the things that um, I think the construction industry has played at for a while. And, you know, I, I you know, I was at Katera, right? I was head of engineering at Katera and Katera was trying to solve the entire problem in one big bite. Right. And obviously yeah. that didn't work. But, but I think the idea is correct. And that is that it's a, it's a, there is no silver bullet, right? Nobody's gonna come along. You're not gonna, none of us are saying, wow, look at these 3D printers. That's the end of the housing affordability crisis. Um, you know, there, it, there, everything helps a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my view is if, if we didn't send materials to landfill, who, who's paying for those materials to go to landfill? right? The customers are paying, right? There's no one else. That's the, the customer pays for everything. And, and so what we've got to do is we've got to, each part of this has got to be connected in the sort of Katera dream way, honestly, uh, through the industry coming together and saying, if we design better, we design right size, we design buildings for the people that are within them, um, so that as their life changes, the building can change. If we create a circular economy for materials, if we use lower carbon materials that have higher life expectancy, all of these things will reduce cost. And the goal here is to leave the customer with more money in their pocket at the end of the month. And, and you can measure that. You can measure how much better it is for the customer at the end of the month with every single thing that we do. And you know, according to work that I've been doing, we can make a significant impact on the monthly cost to a customer through these methods. So would you say that all the that, that the builders are out there are asking the wrong questions? And if they are, where where does the the shift happen? Um, and does the educational system have to get involved to help teach people to ask different questions or or yeah. the trades, how do, how do the trades learn to ask different questions? Yeah, you know, you know, I don't, 
I don't. I, first of all, the construction industry is full of really smart people. I mean, the, yeah. the, you know, I don't. I don't think disruption of the construction industry has to come from outside because there aren't smart enough people in the construction industry. Don't believe that at all. Yeah. Um, but I do believe that we we do things. We think the way that we do things today, the way that that we procure and build and own and operate and and design, we think that this is just how it is. It, it's a purely, it's a construct of the last hundred years. So we are simply copying what has been done for the last hundred years. Yeah. You know, if you go back a longer period of time, I mean, homes in India 4,000 years ago were built sustainably, right? They didn't have air conditioning. They pointed them at the wind. They used, they self-shaded. They used mm -hmm. materials with a high thermal mass that used nighttime cooling. The, 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 you know, we, humans are pretty smart and ingenious, and they did really cool things. The last hundred years has been a period of plenty. We've just believed that unlimited resources, and so we've designed a sort of disposable society, and we've designed disposable housing. The average age of housing in the U.S. is only about thirty years old. So the average building st stock for housing is about thir 30 years, and we maintain those 30-year old houses. So we think that's just, the future is just, this is how it is. But we just invented this the last 100 years. We're now in a new period of history where we realize there are not unlimited resources. So why would we do things in exactly the same way and expect a different outcome? That's crazy. We've got to start by saying, well, we need a different approach. And, you know, a, a, an example was Katera trying a different approach. Okay, well, that didn't work. But somebody will find a different way of creating homes for people that are affordable by taking a different approach to solving the problem. And so builders aren't asking the wrong questions. They're just uh, currently just plugging themselves into a system that's 100 years old, and they make money at it. So they go, well, you know, why, why wouldn't we do that? I'm saying I think there's much more money to be made by everybody by reinventing the approach to creating affordable housing. Yeah, for sure. So I'm actually going to go to a question here from Joel real quick, and then we got some other uh, topics we're going to cover with, uh, with uh, Mr. Burroughs. You are taking a lot of you were talking a lot about spaces for occupant needs, but what about site specific specificity? I can't even say that word. I'll leave that one up to you. Surely, thank you. Surely it has to take that into account. I completely agree with what you are saying, but I'm trying to highlight that mass customization as a solution to housing affordability and total life cycle cost. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I do think you know buildings are designed site specific. Um, and and it's really easy to say um, that the the um, theref therefore everyone has to be different. Um, but I would say uh, not really. So uh, you know, if eighty or ninety percent of every home can be standard, and ten or you fifteen know, percent can be specific to the site. So you know, uh, you know, you say things like orientation. Well, you could take a box. You could orientate it in any direction. Uh, maybe it takes account of views. Maybe there's mm -hmm. slopes on the site, but I, you know, I would guess that you know uh, that the, the, there are many components. Well, you know, the components of the building, walls, floors, and roofs, predominantly the same. Um, the windows and doors, predominantly the same. Yeah. And um, and so I think we've got to design not just this idea of mass customization, meaning that you know every building is unique. Uh, isn't entirely what I believe. I think there are large proportions of buildings that can be exactly the same, and there are small proportions that have to be unique to the site. And the question is, how do you put them together to produce something that respects its location? And um, you know, that might be whether it's in a seismic zone or a hurricane zone, or it snows or it's sunny. And there are some some specifics that are re related to the geography. And then there are some specifics that relate to the site. Yep. But within that variability, much of it is exactly the same. And I would say that, you know, if you looked at every home in the United States and said, you know, um, which ho how much of the buildings have two by fours within the buildings, mm -hmm. you get a pretty big percentage number. And so, you know, construction is generally uh, standard products put together in a unique way. 
uh, and I and I support that that's an approach that we should be taking. Perfect, Joel. Appreciate that. Greg, you Galdi in the house, Dave and Jennifer and Steve make some very good points, including as to ROI. Greg is the past chair of the National Association of Home Builders. So, Greg, always a pleasure when you join us. You would know all about the big builders out there and, and what's uh, what makes their decisions for sure. Um, Greg's also a developer as well, and he's very interested in uh reduction of carbon and offsite construction. So it's always fun when he joins us. Uh, Gregory, what's happening? Panelized construction will reduce waste, employ lower skilled labor and construction, 10% of the current methods. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, you know, we, you have a lot of people on your show, Dave, that talk about offsite construction and various yeah. solutions, you know, panelized, volumetric, you know, different components, materials, all of these things. Uh, and I ask the same question on it uh, when I attend every single show is, uh, is it cheaper? And, um, I, you know, I think that that that, it, that right now there isn't anybody doing offsite construction who says that they actually have a product that is uh, cheaper than onsite construction. And I think cost really matters. Uh, we've got to look at it more holistically. I agree with the return on the investment idea. Yeah. We've got to look at, you know, not just the cost to create it, but what is the total cost of owning something? How do we create value through the materials? And how do we maximize the return on the investment for the buyers? And I think if you were if you were buying a house and you understood the return on your investment better than you currently do, you would make better decisions. And right. it's really weird because most of the stuff that we do, most of the investments that we make personally, we look at what the return is on that investment, you know, whether it's your 401k plan, whatever it might be. But for housing, we sort of don't. We sort of hope, you know, the housing market's boom bust and uh, cost is whatever the market says it is. And we just sort of believe that we're, we're going to make money out of buying things. Well, right now it's unaffordable. So yeah. you're not going to make money. You might lose your home. You might get foreclosed on. Um, you know, we've got to we've got to do better in informing the customers of what is a good investment and what isn't. Sure. Are you familiar uh, familiar with Ivory Innovations and their uh, hack a house? Yeah. 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 Are you involved with them at all? No. no. Yeah. So for those out there that don't know, it's an annual 24 hour hackathon created to engage students in uh, proposing innovative solutions to address the housing affordability crisis. Uh, maybe it'll take a binge episode of everybody and a high dose of caffeine <laughs> with high energy students to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. So it could be a lot of fun to, uh, for, for people to check that out and join in it. And I'm glad you're, uh, I'm glad you're in the know on it because it's a, it's yeah. a really great event. It is. It is. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of great things. I love these ideas of like, you know, get, getting people together and aggregating ideas, but equally getting the, the next generation to get involved yeah. in designing the places that they're going to live in. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that is a sort of problem. I would say everybody I talk to who's sort of under 35 years of age, who doesn't own a home, right. presently thinks they're never going to be able to afford a home. And, uh, and we have no, you know, we, we grew up, I certainly grew up in a time where it was sort of expected that, that you know, that was a stage of, of building your personal wealth was owning your own home and getting on the property ladder. And, yep. and I don't know what it does if, if, if we create a generation of people who are renters and, uh, and, and have no possibility of owning property. It seems right. like we're creating a, you know, bigger society divide. Um, we've got to do something about that. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you make it unaffordable to have the uh, so-called so American dream, yeah. well, then, you know, obviously, you know, it's just common sense that something's going to suffer from it. Something's going to change, you know, if uh, if more people that can afford to own it, own it, and less people that have the opportunity at a lower income can afford to own it. Um, Steve, let's jump in. You sent me a couple of slides. Why don't you walk us through a few of them, if that's all right? And then I want to talk about what your thoughts are on the car carbon agenda that's out there. So- Sure. Here's an average age U.S. home, you know, over time. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I wanted to sort of, I, you know, I've been, I was doing some research, was really trying to understand U.S. home building stock. You know, how old is it? You know, what does it cost to maintain it? I mean, my analogy here is that I don't know how many people are, uh, well, I do know how many people are on watching your show, Dave, that have a 40-year-old car. Um, and it's not very many, right? How many have a 40-year-old iPhone? It's zero. And um, but but 40 year old property is sort of the average in the US. 
Mm -hmm. and so we've got a huge number of homes that were designed to standards that, that on average, standards that we wouldn't accept today. So, you know, number one, uh, affordable building stock, we've got to create much more to lower total cost of ownership for the existing building stock. And this mm -hmm. is just showing some idea that pretty well over the last 100 years, the average age of homes has remained at about 35 years of age. How about this? Yeah, so so houses, we think houses are presently like much, much less affordable than they ever were, but the price per square foot for a home, adjusted for inflation, has remained much the same uh, over the last, you know, 40, 40 years or so. So, you know, that's not necessarily the problem. The problem right. is income, income hasn't risen uh, to match the home prices. So that's created this disparity between household income and uh, property prices. So, yeah, if you move on. Yeah. This is, this is interesting that, you know, this is a study that was done to look at the average size of homes uh, in different places in the world. So I, I mentioned this a little earlier, yep. that the UK, the average size of a home in the UK, uh, these are properties that, that, that um, are all, all uh, single family homes that have been constructed is, you know, just over 800 square feet. Average size of home in the United States is three times that. And, you know, there is a, another slide that's in here that shows the occupancy uh, rate of, of homes in each of those places. Not this one, but there's another slide. And, and, it, and uh, here, this one. This is, this is a sort of busy slide. But what it's trying to show here is if you just look at the number on the top right, yeah. um, the, the, it's 1,058 square feet per person uh, in a home in the United States. So every single person needs over 1,000 square feet. And in, in 1970, it was about 500 square feet. So these are a lot of slides that are just saying, you know, we've got to the point where we've just built bigger and bigger and bigger homes, right. which cost more money to heat and cool, and they got and create more work that needs to be maintained. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is like, why? What is the value of doing that to the buyer? And I'm not advocating that we just, everybody lives in a tiny home. I'm saying that people should be able to design their homes to expand and contract to suit their life. And we don't design homes. We design them as completely fixed elements. Yeah. And the builder walks away at the end of construction. And if you want to, if you have children and you want to add a bedroom, you probably, you either, you, you, you either need to expand into the, into the loft, into the, a roof or something, or you need to move house. And we could design homes where you could plug in parts of the building and you could sell them again later. I mean, modular construction, certainly volumetric, gives you that potential to yeah. add and subtract, subtract from your home as you require. And we don't design uh, homes in that way. Whereas we design a lot of other products to be changed over its life to suit the, the user. Uh, we don't design homes that way. Yeah, and I just put Gregory's comment up. It kind of mimicked what you were saying there a little bit. So I just wanted to add that to it. So, yeah. you know, so does that include designing for multi generational living? You know, kids and the grandparents all have the space that they need. I think I think it evolves around it, the cusp, putting the customer at the center. So whatever yeah. you might want to do, you should be able to do it. Your home is. Is your is your place right? It's your it is, you know in 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 the UK we say an Englishman's home is his castle, and um, and it is that view. It's like you know it's my place. It's my safe right. place. It's where I can live the life that I want to live, and we don't put the customer at the center of it anywhere near enough. Yeah. And and if we do so, we will get a different design, and we've got to create spaces that people want that they're proud of. And right now, you know, I look at, you know, where I live and the homes are designed in a style that probably are re reminiscent of my grandparents. And, and I say, that is not the style that I'm pretty sure most people here would want to live in. But that's all the market offers. Look at tract right. homes across the United States. They all look the same, right? And did people who had a hand in the design of those homes, only 2% of single family homes have an architect involved in the design. So the designs are just cookie cutter, churn out homes 
that people are reminiscent of the past. And I'm saying that is not the way to create affordable housing. We need homes that reflect the future, the way people want to live their lives in the future and, and are aligned with, um, you know, if you look at what a telephone was like 50 years ago, um, you know, compared to what it is today, and, and you'd say, my God, it's unbelievable the change that's occurred. But look at homes. They look exactly the same. Sure. And uh, there's something wrong when we're sort of stuck in the past and, uh, and we need to do something much better. For sure. Quick shout out, George Ryman. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, good morning from sunny in uh, pleasant Phoenix, Arizona. Well, I, I have sunny today, but I don't know if I have pleasant <laughs> when it comes to the, the weather outside. And a uh, shout out to Rami from YouTube. He said, you might want to consider the value that non-AEC background bring to the industry. To achieve your vision for a circular economy, you'll need to consider the education software engineers bring in. Thoughts? Yeah. I, I agree. I think I think that whilst I said I think the construction industry is full of capable people, I also think that there needs to be help from not just not just tech, right. but but you know um, if you look at if you look at sustainability, for example, um, there's so much so many things we can learn from nature. I mean, termites cool their termite mounds without any mechanical systems, right? And they're just as examples. You know, look at how trees can produce leaves in the summer that could shade our, ho our homes when we need shade and, right. they and they lose their leaves in the winter when we don't. There are so many things that, that I think we need biologists, we need psychologists, we need tech. Uh, we need many people coming in to help us create a better built environment. But I think ultimately the construction industry has to do it for itself. Yeah. And I think, you know, like I said, the hard part is following the money, right? If the like, why change if uh, there's no need to change when you look at, you know, what really is controlling the market. But I also think the new tech and I also think that the younger generation coming in is going to help move the move the chains a little bit towards that change because they want better as well. Um, so. Does designing the right size home for the way people want to live uh, organically address carbon reduction? Yeah, it does. It does. Because because right now, you know, my my analogy is that, you know, I see people, I've got friends, they put solar panels on the roof of their 50 year old track town. Right. Yeah. And, they, and I say that's that's about the same as sticking a solar panel on the top of a Ford F-150 and claiming you've got an electric vehicle. Right. Um, it wasn't designed for that. Um, you know, you're generating power when you don't need it. You know, it just feel, it just sort of feels the right thing to do. So I think there are, I think there are many people who want to own their own home who don't know how to do it. We're in we're in a really highly regulated industry. This is a life safety critical industry in which we create a product that might last 60 to 100 years. Right. There's not many industries. There's not many people building airplanes that are going to be around in 100 years time or cars. Right. So, so you know, we, we're a highly regulated industry, which means that not anybody can do it. You know, you've got to be a professional engineer to stamp and seal documents. You need building control and fire department. You know, there, there are rules that, that are really important to follow. But, but that being said, we could do so much better. And, and in terms of sustainability, you know, if you build something and don't care about how it's how it's operated or maintained, which is what is happening with single family home construction, the builder walks away and the, the homeowner is left to deal with the consequences of uh, poor quality construction or right. leaky windows or whatever. Um, that's not a very good way to be sustainable. So we want to design play, uh, buildings that are as efficient as they can be with the goal of leaving as much money in the customer's pocket at the end of the month. I mean, that's the goal. That's what affordability really is. Well, and I agree with that. And, you know, that brings me back, you know, talking a little bit more about the carbon and the carbon reduction and all of these goals and the new products that are coming out. Will, will people pay extra for that over their hardwood floors? Would they, they say, well, I'm going to help the environment versus put in my hardwood floors or my paper stone countertops? Yeah, no, nobody will. Nobody will pay extra. I mean, you'll get a small proportion of the of the population that will pay more money because they feel good about um, uh, saving the planet, right? And um, and and you know that's fine. But but mainstream 
if we really want to save the planet, we really want to uh, reduce the impact of humans on the climate, uh, we've got to get the costs of the products that go into that uh, down below the incumbent products. Now, you know, in some ways, we're going to get helped by that because, you know, ultimately, I believe there will be some sort of carbon tax and we'll end up having to pay something close to the full price of impact of the products that we use presently. Right now, we don't. So we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be flying around on airplanes if we actually paid for the carbon impact of, of, of uh, you know, airplanes being in the air. And right. it would destroy the economy if we did that. So, you know, this will happen incrementally. But my point is it will come as, as legislation and carbon tax comes in play, it will help us to make a better case for more sustainable materials. But right now, those materials have to be able to compete with incumbent materials. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing, you know, because at least it defines the problem is that, you know, if you want to put solar panel on your roof, you should be able to calculate the total cost of ownership of that and return on that investment and be able to make a good decision. Uh, presently, I don't think it's very easy to do that. You keep going back to building products throughout this whole conversation. Anything uh, that you're working on behind the scenes we should know about, Steve Burrows? Sure. I, you know, I, I, you know, things that I'm, I, you know, I get involved in things that I'm passionate about. I mean, I honestly believe that if you look at what DT Materials is doing, for example, you know, taking forest clean out wood and convert it, converting it into a fireproof insulation. You know, what a cool story that is. And I think there's a product there that can compete um, and and be better and be much better, you know, carbon negative and better for the environment. So, you know, there are some really cool things out there. I love what, you know, mycelium is, you know, using mushrooms and to replace leather. And, you know, there's a lot of really cool innovations in the product world that's taking place. Bamboo is an amazing material that doesn't get used anywhere near enough. So there's a lot of so good stuff happening, but but each of those products has to play into a, a system that allows it to 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 be used to best effect. So if you if that, if you could create those products and then at the end of the life that you want from them, you could sell them to someone else, then you also create a completely different value proposition around those materials. Yeah. So I think the circular economy helps getting sustainable products into the construction industry. And right now it doesn't really exist. Nobody nobody sells a piece of their home to their neighbor. And uh, there's a huge opportunity to do that. For sure. Well, we're almost at time here. I'm gonna go to a couple more questions and we're gonna wrap up with one more question uh, at the end here. So Michael Bruce, good afternoon from the Gulf Shores. Steve, great insight and food for thought. The fact is that the construction is incredibly fragmented. I mean, nobody in the construction industry anywhere in the world has 1% of the market. So, you know, it's incredibly fragmented. Uh, where it's aggregated, it really gives you the opportunity to have an impact at scale. So I would say right now, um, serial home builders in the United States are struggling because interest rates have gone up, the affordability problem we're talking about today has reduced uh, the demand for their products. And so, you know, I read every day about sites being mothballed. I think what I'm describing is an opportunity to rethink how they can create a product that appeals to people who are presently unable to enter the marketplace. And uh, if they do that, they'll create a whole new customer base. And if one of those home builders does that, uh, every one of the others will have to follow. And we all know the leader as a as an opportunity in the marketplace that puts them ahead of everyone else. So, you know, I would say, you know, there's a challenge there um, for, the, for the primary home builders to say, let's do a rethink and let's create something that is a product that we can be involved with through its whole life, that, that is more customer focused uh, and reduces the cost of home ownership and uh, and and there won't be anybody who's sad about that. Yeah, I agree. Cooper Lane, Brave Control Solutions, a sponsor of today's show as well. I love it when our sponsors tune in. We must be doing something right if they actually want to watch what we have to talk about. 
So, Cooper, good to see you. Hello from Brave Control Solutions in Windsor, Ontario. Great to see you guys. Great to see you as well, Cooper. Uh, it's kind of funny calling somebody my own name all the time, right? <laughs> Cooper Lane. <laughs> Cooper, Cooper. It's like that uh, movie, right, Doctor? Doctor. Um, all right, Steve, This is we're going to wrap it up here. You mentioned that we need tech biologists, psychologists to come together and help solve these problems. But ultimately, it's up to us, those living and breathing in the building industry. Can we all come together to solve these big problems? Your thoughts? Yeah, I, I sort of feel like <clears throat> and this might be a bit like, you know, I had a dream sort of stuff. But, but you know, I sort of feel like that every, everybody has a common interest in trying to solve this affordability problem. And if there was a way in which everybody who was playing could exchange some some equity for for support to help each other, there was some sort of you know, just imagine there's some equity exchange system where right. somebody who invents new materials could could give a piece of that to a home builder who wants to use the new materials. But just in this sort of ecosystem that we're all in this together, we all want to help create create homes that our children can afford to buy uh, if we if we thought in in that way and tech you know has, has shown us how to do that through open source software and freeware you know they they create a market shift by, mm -hmm. by you know putting it out there if we did that in the construction industry we could make a huge difference and presently it's it's it the coming together we need a sort of a way in which we can have what a holistic approach and a shed, you know, rising tide raises every boat approach to solving this problem. And there are a few people, you know, trying these things, you know, give credit to Nolan Brown and ADL Ventures on trying to put together something, you know, that to, to focus on this. And, and the, you know, there are, there are a whole bunch of people who are, who are trying to do this, but it feels like there should be a, an industry initiative, maybe around, the, the you know national association of house builders or something uh, to allow everybody to benefit from what each other is doing and if we all focus on this problem you know if we can put a man on the moon in 1969 i'm pretty sure we can solve the affordable housing crisis in 2023 one would think so <laughs> one, one would think so but here we still are you know struggling and and i use the i use nasa as the analogy all the time from my good friends uh uh, Jerry Makahi, you know, the greatest offsite builders in the world is NASA. They don't they don't get up there and pull out their plans while they're floating around in space and they look at it and it says field verify. Like there's just yeah. some things moving on. Steve, is there anything that we didn't cover that you really want people to know or did we do a good job today? I you always do a great job, Dave. I want to take the opportunity like while I'm on to to say thank you because you know, you 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 set out on this mission of of you know showcasing what's going on and, and bringing people together and uh, and I think you do an absolutely fantastic job and I, I you know on behalf of everybody who's watching the show or has been on the show uh, I just like to say thank you to you. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I wouldn't have anything to talk about if it wasn't for all of you. <laughs> so let's be real here, right? You know, yeah. you're you're the food that keeps me going, and I appreciate what everybody's doing out there, and I think it's uh it. It's, it's an honor to actually be a part of something that truly is starting to see a lot of attention and a lot of change. Um, you know, you always ask, you know, you know, what do you want your legacy to be? And I think for, for what we do here at Dave Cooper Live, it's actually to have a part of being uh, being a part of something bigger than us. It's easy yeah. to chase money. It's easy to chase dollars. It's easy to do all of those things. But at the end of the day, what were you truly known for? And that's kind of something that we live and breathe by. And, and I think if we can get people to talk and collaborate, just like we're ending on the show here, collaboration, I mean, that's the keys to success and uh, moving forward, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, we, you know, we all ultimately have to figure out what we want to be remembered for. That's what legacy is. Yeah. And, um, and we've got to do better. And um, it's what sustainability is. We want to do better for the generations that follow us. And, and right now we have a problem and and we can solve it. And we just need to put our put our shoulders to the wheel and all push together. Uh, and it will it will change. And so thank you for being a part of that, Dave. Appreciate it. Yep. I'm 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 happy to be a part of it. Thank you. All right, everybody. Steve, stay right there. 
Listen, one last time, if you're not registered, we got you a discount code. Check it out, DC Live 10. Save yourself 10%. It's one of the greatest advanced prefab shows out there. You want to hang out with and rub shoulders with the big players in the off-site industrialized construction industry? This is the place to be. So use the discount code, save yourself a little bit of money, and uh, go out to dinner or something like that. All right, everybody. That's going to be a wrap for today's show. Please make sure you say hello to all the sponsors and the people that support us, because that's the only way we can bring on people like Steve Burroughs and others to keep showcasing and providing change, hopefully in an industry that needs change so much. So that's a wrap for today. We'll see you Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern. And man, do we have a show lined up for you. I'm Dave Cooper. We'll see you next time. Bye now. What an amazing show. Thank you to all of our sponsors for helping us to continue to bring all of these innovative conversations to all of you out there. Please visit them, see what they have to offer you. And as always, subscribe to the YouTube channel and ring that bell. It would mean the world to us. I'm Dave Cooper. Thanks for watching.